embarked on an international career after I started to doubt the relevance and the impact of the work that I was doing until then in France. I was working in the media world and as a, as a press pu publisher. And I came to realize that the strong ethic component of journalism that had actually driven me towards this profession was in fact trampled and ignored to the benefit of more economic and financial consideration or the wise called profits. This is when I decided to leave and went to work for an NGO, Handicap International in former Yugoslavia during the peak years of the war in 93 and 94. I went there thinking I knew what wars were. After all, I was educated. I was coming from a free country with the free access to information. I had read many books about the wars, seen many movies. I had also followed up very closely on the news of the world, you bet. And I had discussed wars with many old people, including people who had survived camps and prisons. So I thought that I knew what war was all about. But my first months in Bosnia were brutal. I saw war in real times and in crude light. I witnessed the, the destruction, the misery, the suffering, the tragedy it creates. I saw cities burned to the ground, completely flattened by bombardment. I saw houses with their walls so full of bullet holes that they hardly stood up. I saw people who had just stepped on anti-personal minds and they had lost a limb or more. I saw wounds that I never thought could happen on people. I saw children tied to radiators and treated worse than animals and God knows that animals are badly treated in our world. I met women who had been raped, abused, tortured. I saw wars. And I realized then that I knew nothing about wars because I had never experienced it in my emotion before. You can know something intellectually, but until such time you know it emotionally, you don't know it. So truth be told, I got shaken on my basis. And six months down the line, after I arrived in Yugoslavia, I started to doubt and to lose my faith. My faith in humanity, my faith in people. Because if people were able to do to each other so horrible things, then little hope was left. <laughs> So one day I was in a psychiatric ward at a hospital in a city called Doboj in the north of Bosnia. I was discussing with the psychiatric doctor in charge of the ward because as Handicap International, we were supporting the treatment of people with mental disability and psychiatric disorders. So I had regular visits to those psychiatric uh, wards to assess their needs. And as I was uh, discussing with the doctor in his office, we, we discussed about many things and, and he certainly felt that I was shaken by my experience I think he felt my doubts. So at one moment he, he asked me and he said, Valerie, can you go and open that door? Which was the door that was leading to his uh, waiting room. And he said, look into it and tell me what you see. So I did as he asked and, um, and I came back and I told him, well, this is your waiting room and I saw your patients waiting for you. And he said, yeah, but who are those patients? So I replayed the images in my mind and this is when I said, and I realized, well, they were all men. And then he asked me, and what more? And then I remembered their faces, their attires. And this is when I said, well, they visibly are all combatants, soldiers. And then this doctor smiled, came to sit next to me. He looked me in the eyes and he said, people who are sent, on the front lines. People who commit atrocities, they too suffer from those acts and atrocity. And this is why they come to me. They need me to help them overcome and cope with the horrible things they do. Human beings are not made to kill. When they do, they suffer. And at that very moment, the doctor restored my faith in humanity. Thanks to him, I did not give up. I stayed in Yugoslavia and I carried on my career up until today, 28 years down the line. <laughs> the other example that I want to share takes time in more recent time, in between 2013 and 2016 in Guatemala. And Guatemala is a country that has also suffered immensely. Its people and principally the indigenous people have been killed, murdered, tortured, humiliated during 36 years of war from the 60s till 1996. While there is peace now in Guatemala, 
the country is still in a very bad shape, mostly because of bad governance. 60% of the population is poor. 95% of those poor are actually indigenous people. And at the time I was there, although I don't think it has changed much nowadays, this country was ruled by very corrupt leaders. Little development was taking place. The progress that occurred was only benefiting a few and inequalities were skyrocketing. Of course, corruption scandals were punctuating the daily life, but people were fed up. But in reality, they were not doing anything about it because the entire population still suffered the trauma of war. They had learned in the most horrible way to shut up, to swallow it, to accept their fate, to be subdued. So at that time, I was also considering our work. I said, the UN has been in Guatemala for 50 years. And I wondered, what's the result of our work if 50 years later, the country is still in this situation? I started to doubt the relevance and the impact of our UN endeavor. Then one day, a corruption scandal, maybe bigger than others, shook the entire nation. The scandal actually had been revealed by a, a UN-sponsored commission to fight corruption in, a, in Guatemala. And in a matter of days, the entire population woke up, called for action, went down the streets of Guatemala City. And over a period of 140 days, actually four months, every Saturday, hundreds of thousands of people across the entire country staged protests and demonstration against their corrupt leaders, asking for justice, transparency, and democracy. Those protests was, were completely peaceful. Not a single window got broken. Not a single shot was shot. Nobody got injured or killed. And at the end of those demonstrations, people usually collected the garbage to leave the place clean. But the most beautiful part of it all was that as a result of the demonstration uh, and demands of people, legal action took place. And the then president and vice president got jailed. And they are still jailed as, as, as we speak. So this is when I realized that, wow, but all the awareness campaigns on human and civic rights that the UN has been doing have been useful. All those trainings of civil society have paid off. So my hope got completely restored in the work that we do as UN in its impact that ultimately it has. It might have taken a bit of time to show, but it showed. So the main takeaway of these two examples that I shared with you today is one, that human beings are good by nature. Events and circumstances may bring, bring them to be or to become bad and commit bad, bad action, but intrinsically people are good. Human beings are not made to kill. The second point that I want to bring is that doubts are an essential and indispensable component in the improvement of our work in the betterment of the world. Because doubt, doubts push us to apply self-criticism, to reevaluate ourselves, what we do, not to rest on our laurels and, and to see other options. And doubt also maintain hope because if there is doubt, it means that there is hope, otherwise why doubting? <laughs> Thirdly, hope is the one feeling that is so essential in the building of future the hope that things can be better, that change is possible. And lastly, to envision the change, to build the future, you need capacities to know or to harness your hope. You need to know what to hope for. And this is exactly how I see our job as UN, for instance, through our normative agenda, formulating norms, standards, making people aware of their rights, of, their, of the duties of their leaders, we give hope, and the means to transform their hope into actions. Thank you very much.